Well, good evening. Good, evening. good to see you all again. Um, tonight, I want to first thank Pastor Mark um, and the rest of the elders uh, that have allowed me to come forth uh, tonight uh, to be able to share once again what God has laid on my heart. Uh, it's not only an honor, but a humbling privilege to do so. Uh, as most of you know, I preached last year at Tartar Day, and we went through the first five verses of uh, 1 John chapter 5, uh, and this evening I felt it was only fitting to continue where I left off. <laughs> so, I uh, just try to make it easy on myself. <laughs> so, um, I know personally some of you love the show Dateline, uh, my mother-in-law included, and uh, other shows of court cases and trials. Um, there's been some high-profile cases over the years, from O.J. Simpson to Bernie Madoff, Timothy McVeigh to Scott Peterson, and the list goes on and on. Uh, when it comes to court cases, there are many people involved. You have the prosecutors and the defendants. You also have the judge and the jury. Uh, cases can be quick, and others can drag on for weeks, months, or even years. Uh, while studying, I did a quick research, uh, search and found that the longest civil lawsuit in U.S. history lasted over 60 years, from 1834 to 1889. And according to the Guinness World Records, back in 2004, the fastest court case in history came from New Zealand, where a jury lasted just one minute to consider the verdict. So in a jury trial, there is a variety of evidence presented and multiple testimonies that are given. Uh, after much thought, the judge and or jury must make a reasonable judgment regarding all of the facts that have been given to them. There is a lot of emotions and intensity that comes in these trials. There is also an understanding of how serious the trial may be, especially if someone's life is on the line. After all of the back and forth, the evidence and the testimonies given, a verdict must be given. This section of scripture that we will be looking at provides us with that courtroom setting. This trial is a matter of life and death. And in this trial, there will not be a hung jury. A firm decision will and must be made. So before we get to the verdict, we need to listen to those witnesses and their testimonies. Would you please stand with me and turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, and I will begin in verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness of God is this, that he has bore witness about his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the witness which God has borne witness about his Son. And the witness is this, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this evening as we have gathered again as your church, as one body. We have broken bread and fellowship together. We have celebrated another year in the life of Grace Harvest Bible Church. And now we get to hear your word proclaimed again. I pray that you use the words that are spoken tonight for your glory and for your will to be done. Amen. So I have titled this sermon, Can I Have a Witness? And I know some of you might be thinking, oh gosh, is he getting Pentecostal on us? But um, no, that's not the case. There won't be any yelling or grunting. Otherwise, Jesse would be up here. So, um, <laughs> so 
in this passage, John's argument that Jesus is the Son of God is settled by the testimony of these five witnesses. Water, blood, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the faithful. Chapter 5 concludes the book of 1 John, emphasizing the supremacy of love in the Christian experience. Because of these testimonies, the teachings from Scripture, and the evidence provided, we can have the assurance of eternal life. In verses 6 through 8, we see John giving a deliberation. A deliberation means to give long and careful consideration to something. It also means to use slow and careful thought as you weigh what is being said. As we continue going through this passage, try to imagine yourself in a courtroom as the witnesses come forth. We need to carefully consider the evidence and testimonies that are given. We need to weigh how accurate and credible the witnesses are who testify. So before we look at the witnesses, let's go over who we are talking about here. And John tells us immediately at the beginning of verse 6 who we are talking about. He says, this is the one. The one is referring to Jesus Christ. The one and only object of true saving faith. This is the one and only else, no one else, no one else is named as the Son of God. As mentioned in the previous verse, in in verse 5. Dr. Steve Lawson puts it this way. There is only one door that leads to heaven. There is only one bridge that leads from this world to the presence of God. There is only one ladder that we may ascend upward to God. And it is this one, Jesus Christ. End quote. So this is the one who came. The word came here means to arrive from another location. To arrive from another place elsewhere. Jesus Christ came from heaven to enter this world and shows that he pre-existed before this life. Some cross-references to support this are John 1, 9. There was the true light which came into the world, enlightens everyone. John three nineteen, And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. John 3, 3. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. John seven thirty six. What is this statement that he said? You will seek me and you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. And lastly, John thirteen three. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God, and was going back to God. And obviously there are more, but that was just a few. So now let's look at the first two witnesses, the water and the blood. Jesus call, uh, excuse me, John calls Jesus, he who came by water and blood. This reference to water and blood has been interpreted in many ways. Some believe water and blood refers to his physical nature coming as an infant to earth. Others refer back to the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 34 and 35, where it states, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has been seen has borne witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. So at first glance, this seems like a great parallel, yet... Jesus didn't come by the water and blood during this event. Yes, water and blood flowed out of his body and was a defiant symbolism regarding the testimony concerning Jesus. However, it is not the direct application of this particular passage. It is more likely that the water refers to his baptism by John the Baptist in the uh, River Jordan. And the blood refers to his sacrifice on the cross. So these are the bookends of Jesus' earthly ministry as Messiah and as Deliverer. This interpretation was first given and explained by the 2nd and 3rd century theologian Tertullian. 
Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 states, And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And behold, there was a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we see John the Baptist wasn't just sent to testify about Christ, but to baptize him as well. Something as simple as water, a substance on earth that has given and taken away life, is the means by which God uses to save his people as they cross from death to life. In our baptism, we die to our sins and take on the perfection of Christ as laid out in Romans chapter 6. Verses 4 through 7. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been justified from sin. So in this moment of Jesus' baptism, God is spoken as a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in an incredible picture of the Trinity. But Jesus' baptism wasn't done for the purpose of removing his sins, because Jesus didn't have any, but instead sanctifies the waters of baptism for us. It was a fulfillment, excuse me, it was to fulfill all righteousness that he would identify with those whom he came to save. It is here that Jesus reveals himself to be fully God with the full saving power of God. His baptism was a testimony of his divinity. Baptism testifies that on account of Christ, our sins are forgiven. It is a testimony or evidence of our salvation that God gives our anxious hearts. So when our hearts put God on trial, asking him if you really love me or us, or did you really die for us, it is really powerful enough to save us. Baptism is one of the pieces of evidence he puts forth for us to hang on to. As the water testifies that Jesus is God, the blood testifies to his humanity. Jesus really lived a human life. He really died and really shed his blood. This wasn't just a spiritual exercise or his crucifixion defiantly wasn't even hypothetical. As we look at the testimony of the blood, I want to give you seven merits of the blood of Christ. Number one, it has accomplished the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.22, and according to the law, one may also say all things are cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Number two, the redemption from bondage. 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your futile conduct inherited from your forefathers. Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of his grace. Three, the blood of Christ has reconciled us to God. Colossians 1.20, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Ephesians 2, 3, among whom we all also formerly conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even at the rest. Four, cleansing us from sin. First John 1 John 1.7 But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 
5. It has brought propitiation of God. Romans 3.25 Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith for a demonstration of His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. 6. We have the justification by and with God. Romans 5, 9, Much more than, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. And finally, 7, We are sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 12, Therefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people through His own blood, suffered outside the gate. So these merits give you so much understanding to the significance of Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed sacrificially for those who would believe. His death was very important and the blood of Christ is so important we cannot and should not ever forget what he did for us. We must have the blood to forgive us of our sin and reconcile us back to God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.23, We preach Christ crucified. We go all the way with our message. In 1 Corinthians uh, 2.2, 2, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. At the Last Supper in Matthew 26, we see stated, And when He, speaking of Jesus, had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Later on, we see in chapter 27 of Matthew, along in Mark 15, 24, Luke 22, 33, and John 19, 18, all summarize the crucifixion of Jesus. And along in John 19, it also speaks about the flogging and the wearing of a crown of thorns, showing even more evidence of Jesus' blood being poured out for us. So this event continues to testify even today. Jesus took on the sin of the world and died a horrendous death. He took on our sins and yours and mine. He suffered and bled for us. Yet three days later, He rose from the grave and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. So let me be clear. Be sure that you trust in Him and Him alone. He only asks for you to repent of your sins and put your complete trust and faith in Him for salvation. So going back to our passage and looking again at verse 6, we see that John writes, not of the water only, but by the water and the blood. So John really doubles down and repeats himself here to really drive the nail home Again, that Jesus Christ was crucified. The reason behind that is because back then there was a lot of false teaching going on, just like today. And he wanted to make sure that everyone was crystal clear on what Christ did for us. Back then, there was false teachings going on from the Gnostics that said that the divine Christ descended on the man of Jesus at his baptism, but then left him before he was crucified. Thus denying this one person, Jesus Christ, came by the blood and the water. This teaching, along with others, were again spread by these Gnostics at this time. They were heretics full of error and false views of true Christianity. And because of them, this is why we see so many writings from John and Paul about combating false teachings in and outside of the church. Again, this is a warning to all of us because this still goes on today. And we must stand firm in our faith and in God's word. We have seen the testimony of the water and the blood. So now let's look at the testimony of the Spirit. The Spirit, as our text proclaimed, testifies because the Spirit is the truth. The third witness is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. God is truth. God cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 20, excuse me, 17 through 20. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, guaranteed it with an oath 
so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of this hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul, a hope before sure and confirmed, and the one which entered within the veil where a forerunner has entered for us, Jesus, having become the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Titus 1, 1 and 2. Paul, a slave of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the full knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which the God, who cannot lie, promised from all eternity. The Holy Spirit testifies to the water and the blood, the baptism and death of Jesus Christ. We see the water and the blood as external testimonies, and we see the Holy Spirit as an internal testimony. And as our page states in verse 8, all three are in agreement. Jesus is the Christ. The Holy Spirit testifies that there is only one name in which we are saved, and that eternal life is found in Jesus alone. Acts 4.12, And there is a salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we are saved. The Holy Spirit continues to testify to us today. Pastor Mark has been preaching on this very statement over the last few weeks. Romans 8 verse 16 tells us, The Holy Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. As the Spirit of God draws men and women to Himself through the preaching of the gospel and through the teaching of His word and through the power of His grace, we see that the Spirit is alive and living. The Spirit is also pointing us to Christ. John 15, 26. When the Advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So when we read Scripture by the Spirit, the Spirit will help us to see Christ in that passage. When we struggle with our faith, the Spirit points us to Christ. Because the strength of our faith isn't in our effort, but is in the object of our faith, and who is Christ Himself. So we continue to look at this as a court case. You may have some that argue that the first two witnesses, the water and the blood, are unable to be cross-examined. This is true. We cannot go back and witness the baptism and crucifixion of Christ. However, the evidence of the truth of these testimonies is seen all around us. And we, as we continue to see the Holy Spirit testify to us today, we see broken hearts healed. We see lives restored. We see marriages mended. And we see souls saved. We see people find their true purpose and hope in life. Verse 8 of this text also shows us something else. John has given us the required amount of witnesses needed by the Mosaic Law. Deuteronomy 19.15 A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. At the mouth of two or three witnesses a matter shall be established. The other part of this necessary to Jewish law as well to our laws today is that the witnesses should agree. And as I stated before in verse 8 shows that the spirit and the water and the blood all agree. They agree that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you may be thinking to yourself, Bill, the passage says that there was only three witnesses. So why do you have five? Uh, well, nah, let's continue looking and we will see those other two witnesses Verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness of God is this, that he has borne witness about his son. So to say it, say it another way, therefore, or here then, is God's testimony about his son, which we ought to accept because it is of greatness. In this verse, we see the fourth witness and the testimony of the father. Like I stated a moment ago about the Jewish law and our law today, 
we see men giving testimony and it is given as taken as truth uh, in any earthly courtroom. If God is the creator of this world, then his testimony is not only greater, but it also can stand alone among all. Again, God is not a liar. As I quoted earlier from Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, we see the heavens open and God himself proclaimed that this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. So we see here God with a booming voice testifying from heaven, proclaiming that his beloved son has come into this earth, into this world. And it is a really significant defining moment. He is saying, this is my son. This is the son of God. You need to listen to him. You need to put your faith and trust in him. And at the death of of Jesus, the centurion even declared, truly, this was the son of God. Matthew 27, 54. So turn your Bibles to uh, the gospel of John chapter 12. Uh, We're going to look at verses 27 through 30. I'll give you a moment to get there. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 27 through 30. It states, Now my soul has become dismayed, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. So don't miss what God said. He says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. So God bore witness to his son at his baptism when he spoke from the heavens, and then he glorified it again at the cross. And as you see, the response of the people in this passage is not much different than we see the responses of people today. Some rightly hear the voice, they hear the call, and their faith is confirmed. Others just write it off as noise or foolishness. Jesus' death on the cross was a judgment on the world. Evil was atoned for. The world's goals, standards, and religions were shown to be folly. Satan's power over people by sin and death was defeated. All these moments where God revealing himself to us factor into the judgment that all men are without excuse. Romans 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who surpass the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. I believe of all of the witnesses, the Father is the most important of them all. Because frankly, without his witness and testimony... We don't have any of the others. It is the Father who designed the plan of salvation. It is the Father who chose the elect. It is the Father who gave the elect to His Son before time began to be their Savior. It was the Father who sent His Son to this world in the fullness of time to be born of a virgin. It was the Father who sent the Holy Spirit to conceive the humanity of Christ and the human body of Christ through Mary. And it was the Father who spent the Spirit to descend upon Jesus in the River Jordan. And then finally, in verse 10 and uh, and 12, we see the final witness, the faithful. The one who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. He who has the Son has life. So this is you if you are a believer. You heard the voice, you listened, and you answered the call. Now that the Spirit lives in you, you too can testify of Jesus Christ. John declares that for believers, this testimony about Jesus is both objective and personal. 
Christians have evidence of the truth because God lives within them. There are natural, powerful effects of our relationship with Christ that can be seen and felt by ourselves and by others. Romans 2, verse 15, in that they demonstrate the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 5, and hope does not put to shame because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. And we may be able to hopefully speak boldly just and in confidence, just like Paul does in Romans 9, verse 1. I am telling you the truth. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. So we as Christians, the faithful, may be the last witness of this case, but in reality there is something else, but better yet, someone that needs to still be discussed. And that is what I left out in the second half of verse 10 and 12. And that is, the one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the witness which God has borne. And later on in 12, he says, He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It is heartbreaking to know that there is and will be people that reject God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said that at the cross, He would draw all men to Himself. He did not mean everyone would be saved, for He made that clear that some will be lost. John chapter 5, 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who is in the tombs will hear my voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Pastor Mark preached on this last week. And we know that for those who love God... All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would, excuse me, it's always good to have water up here. Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So just as each believer has truth in his heart, everyone who disbelieves God has made him uh, out to be a liar. There is no middle ground. There is no suspension of opinion, uh, one and uh, un, excuse me, <clears throat> one either believes or he disputes God's truth. John three eighteen. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John eighteen twenty four. Therefore I say to you, you that you, excuse me, you, I say to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In John 16, 8 and 9. And he, when he comes, will convict the world considering, considering sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they did not believe in me. So the Holy Spirit comes as a prosecutor convicting us of our sin. In verse 9, we see being the most serious sin, and that is the sin of unbelief. When and where the gospel of Jesus Christ has been spoken and shared, the Holy Spirit starts working at convicting unbelievers of their sin and drawing them to Christ. If there is no external testimony of the water and blood, then there is no internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. Again, you can't have one without the other. 
As I stated earlier, they are all in agreement. So they all must be presented uh, present for a life to be changed. Matthew 12, 31 states, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against this spirit shall not be forgiven. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to convict you of your sin and the sin of unbelief. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convince you and to persuade you of the truthfulness of the gospel message, showing us that we are wretched and we are in need of a Savior. If you continue to resist and reject the testimony in your heart, there can come a time where the Holy Spirit will no longer convict you of that sin. We saw that played out with Pharaoh back in Exodus, when God not only hardened his heart, but gave, it, gave him over to what he wanted. So Pharaoh eventually actually hardened his own heart. <clears throat> you do not want to play fast and loose with the truth. You can't keep jumping from one side of the line to the other. When you become a Christian, you put the old you to death and you are now a new creation. We don't become believers and continue to live the same life. There must be a transformation. Any sin will be forgiven except for the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. That is bringing forth the conviction of your sin. You do not want to be in a place outside of Christ. <clears throat> so we have heard the, from the witnesses, and now we have to make a decision or a verdict based on those testimonies. I pray that we all do not revel in the position of a jury in this case. Because in reality, we have all already made our decision or verdict on whether or not we believe in the testimony of the witnesses. We must take a step of faith and make a decision in response to the truth that has been shown to us. God has given us the gift of grace. And if you are here tonight and have not accepted that gift, as long as you have breath in your lungs, it is not too late. If we are looking at our lives as a court case, we must come to the realization that we are not a jury. <clears throat> we are actually the defendant who has mistakenly and pridefully placed ourselves in the position of the jury. Because at the end of this life, we will stand in a courtroom, but there will not be a jury of our peers. And there will be a sentence given out. There will not be a hung jury. And that one judge who will also be the jury is God in the person of Jesus Christ. And he will judge and sentence all, the righteous and the unrighteous. Eternity to heaven or eternity to hell. There's only two options and that's it. There is no purgatory. We'll, we will not be given a second chance to right the wrong. So will you accept or deny the witnesses and their testimonies? Is God a truthful and faithful witness, or do you call him a liar? Faith is more than just a blind leaf off a cliff. Paul states in Romans 10, 14, that no one can believe unless you have heard. There is a response that needs to be made. Will you surrender your pride and humble yourself? I pray that the testimonies and evidence that were presented by John in this passage will give you the faith to trust in Christ alone. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> Father, we, we have heard the truth spoken tonight from your word. And Lord, we as your children who are gathered here, we are so thankful for the witnesses that were proclaimed tonight. The, the water of the blood, Father. The Holy Spirit that is our guarantee inside of us, Father, that uh, conveys to us with our spirit that we are yours. We thank you, Father, for your witness. We thank you, Father, for our fellow believers who are the faithful witnesses as well. We have been forgiven so much, Lord, and I am so thankful, Father, that when we stand on that day of judgment, everyone that has put their faith and trust in you who has believed in you will hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. But those, Father, that will hear those dreadful words, depart from me, I knew you not. Oh, Father, I pray for them. 
that as we have come to that saving faith and believed your witnesses, Lord, that we believe the Holy Spirit. And Father, as my brother conveyed tonight, that one unpardonable sin of the, uh, that blaspheme of the Holy Spirit is rejection of that truth to deny your Son as Lord and Savior. And so, Father, I, I, I pray for the one who does not know you tonight. Lord, as our brother said, as long as we have breath, it's never too late. But there will come a day, Father, when we take that last breath and we who once were alive, Father, and who have trusted in you will be spend eternity with you. And for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, Father, they will spend eternity in darkness apart from you. Lord, I thank you for the preaching of your word tonight. Father, may you receive the glory for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.